Well, before Deacon Clarence and Reverend Victoria come before you, I really just wanted to reiterate some of the things that Pastor went over on last week. What do you remember um, as he was speaking as it related to abundant life? He said abundant life is above the, huh? Speak it loud. Above the common, right? Above the common. So we want to walk over that. It is extra extraordinary qualitative difference not quantitative all right basic ingredients for grounding did anybody write down those rudiments of faith who wrote it down pop up if you got it miss betty said i got it i got it i'm coming to miss betty worship and reading the word prayer and contemplation service witness and work all right, give her a hand, give her a hand. Good job, good job. Good job, good job. And we remember that the routine, and I kind of heard that common thing, you know, setting things, um, scheduling, and making it priority, making it priority. And we talked about the importance of understanding that routine is that's not automatic, right? It doesn't become routine until we put it to practice. And that it's a, it's a process that we are observe, observing, okay? And so those are the things that we want to remember from last week's lesson as it related to being well grounded. So that's our foundation, well. This week we're going to be talking about well rounded. And so um, we're going to have Deacon uh, Clarence Williams and Reverend Victoria Carr leave us, lead us this evening in our uh, discussion as it relates to well-rounded. You're going to put away next week's conversation, next week's packet. You're not paying attention to that. Um, the only thing that should be out are your notes that you're writing from what they're giving conversation. And we're going to walk you through your packet for next week. Amen. Okay, I feel absolutely no love. I'm closing my book, going home. I don't feel no love here. Oh, Lord. That's what y'all get. Hi, I'm Reverend Carr. It's good. To... Y'all don't believe that, huh? How's everybody tonight? All right, all right. We're going to talk about well-rounded uh, tonight. And uh, just before we do... We want to just kind of look at what does it mean to be well-rounded. And being well-rounded to me, meaning using all of the God-given tools that he has given us so that we can adequately represent the kingdom of heaven, so we can disseminate the good word of God. And God gives us all gifts and tools, and we need to find out, and that's what this class is about, Finding out what are those tools that we all have that we can use to help further the kingdom of heaven. You know, that is our job, right? To further the kingdom of heaven. Y'all been reading Matthew 28. I don't want to get off key here because I only have a few minutes. But like Sister Sheila said, y'all looking kind of strange at me this way. But that's what we want to look at as being um, well-rounded, using the tools that God is giving us so that we can help disseminate his truth. And we need to identify some of the uh, abstract things that are there. Oftentimes we look at the things that are obvious. And oftentimes just beneath the surface are abstract things and maybe things that we don't recognize. And we're going to talk a bit about that as we look at our passage this evening. So what I would like to ask someone to do is to read our scripture, which is 1 Samuel Verse uh, chapter 16, verses 17 through 23, so we can have a context from which we will speak. Anyone? There's a couple guys with mics there on either side. You probably don't want to go near Shelton, so you can use this mic. Yeah. yeah. Yes, 1 Samuel chapter 16, verse 17 through 23. I do have a, you know, I'm the candy man, so I got some candy. Oh, there's one right there. So get ready to bribe somebody. Good. Go ahead. 1 Samuel 16, verse 17 through 23. 23, thank you. 
And Saul said unto his servants, Provide me now a man that can play well, and bring him to me. Then answered one of the servants and said, Behold, I have seen a son of Jesse the Bethlehemite that is cunning and playing and a mighty valiant man. And a man of war and prudent in matters and a comely person, and the Lord is within him, is with him. Wherefore Saul sent messengers unto Jesse and said, Send me David thy son, which is with the sheep. And Jesse took an ass laden with bread and a bottle of wine and a kid and sent them by David his son unto Saul. And David came to Saul and stood before him and he loved him greatly and he became his armor bearer. And Saul sent to Jesse saying, Let David, I pray thee, stand before me for he hath found favor in my sight. And it came to pass when the evil spirit from God was upon Saul that David took an harp a harp and harp and played with his hand so Saul was refreshed and was well and the evil spirit departed from him the word as it is written amen thank you all right you probably heard pastor's the sermon if you were in attendance on Sunday and he covered much of the uh, storyline that we have been reading here tonight and the main character of this particular passage is who David all right who's one of the other characters in this passage Saul. And how about a third one? Who was the third one? Jesse. And Jesse was who? All right. We, we got the context now. But David was a unique person in all of his ways, and we can see that not only reading from this passage, and good students uh, will also do background work and read other passages to help us understand more and more about who David was. But what was the first thing that we noticed about David? His one gift that got him noticed. What was that? Playing the harp. Pardon? Playing the harp. There you go. He played the harp. He played the harp, and someone noticed that, that the king was in this funk, and he wanted to get out of it. He said, I know a person who can play the harp. And that, that wouldn't be me. See, I, that would not be the gift to get me in the place, right? You know, everybody see my son, and he can sing and play. And say, did he get that from you? I have to fess up and say, no, because if, you, if that were, was the gift that got me in, I would still be on the outside. But the point, of the, <laughs> the point of the lesson is sometimes it takes one thing to get you in the right position so that you can do even greater things. And that's what it was with David, the one gift that picked him up. But God's already had his hand on David because, as you can see, how David was chosen. He was actually chosen by God, although Samuel came to ask Jesse about his sons and they needed a king for Israel, and he was parading his sons up. How many sons did Jesse have? Anybody remember? Eight. Eight. And where was David in that lineup? He was the last one. And, and, and to let you know, remember the, the oldest son had the birthrights, and you remember the story about the birthrights, and and it falls on down the line. He was at the bottom of the total pole. Had almost as many kids as I do, but he's... Well, Y'all quit laughing at me. But he was the eighth one, so he was way down on the total pole. And remember the job that he had? He was a shepherd. That was not a job that you sought after. That was not the cream of the crop kind of a job. It's kind of like people today, they'll look down at the sanitation workers. It, it was at the bottom of the, of the list. And it lets you know that God does not necessarily go by pedigree. He does not necessarily go by what you know. Uh, God looks at the heart and he chooses persons that he know will carry out what he wants to do. I look at myself as an example. A little country boy from Louisiana, a little small town, shut up Lisa, called Farben, Louisiana. Outside of Shreveport, didn't get to Shreveport till I got a little older, you know, and, and, and took me by the back door of Southern University and brought me all the way to Seattle, Washington, and then to the front door of the firehouse and all the way to some highly lofty things to do. And uh, God, you never know what God has in store for you. So it doesn't matter about your humble beginnings. It's where God is going to take you to. So we should all be encouraged tonight. 
that God has a plan for us, and he always works his plan. But let's look at David. David being the youngest, David was also brave, and he was also filled with faith. Remember his big escapade with the big giant name? All right, just testing you guys. Y'all, are, y'all been reading. Remember, the, remember his, his big test? David showed that he had faith in God and that he was brave, that he had courage. Uh, while all of the grown men was running and hiding, David came out and saying, where is the big giant? I will go and take him on. He said, go back out there and watch the sheep, shepherd boy. You know, that's your job. You're just the little somebody on the total pole. And look at, the, look at what David did through what? Through the way God delivered him. So David, David was able to follow God. Now, it's, it's one thing to be brave. And it's, a good, and it's another thing to have faith. And, and, and they should go together. But when you got God in the mix, that's what makes it all work. Because you can be brave and run into a, a cave of lions, but that may not be so smart if God ain't with you, right? <laughs> so, so you can have courage, but you also got to have sense, right? So, but, but David knew that the hand of the Lord was on him from an early age, and he followed the lead and, and the way that God has led him to. And, and, and you know the story of David. There's a lot of things, but Reverend Carr is going to come behind me and preach. So I'm going to hurry up and get out of your way. But, we, but you remember that David struggled, and David's life was filled with many adventurous kinds of things. He was said to be also a man after God's what? Own heart, all right? God said, he, David is a man after my own, because God could see beyond David's fault. David was well-rounded with many gifts. He played not only the harp, but when you read the passage, he played several different instruments. And the harp was just one of them that he excelled in. So he had many, many talents, and he was a very uh, smart guy. And in order to be able to be the king, God has certainly crowned his head with wisdom and knowledge. But then David has some soft spots, did he not? You know, he's out there taking a smoke break up on the roof, and he looked out and saw this pretty woman bathing over there, Bathsheba, and he said, you know, go over there, send his, Eugene, go over there and tell her to come over here. <coughs> Eugene said, yes, the boss, because I, I, was, I was watching her too. <laughs> that's why he chose him to go. But anyway, that's not in First Samuel. <laughs> that's kind of like at living. <laughs> That's the book of Kevin, five, six. But as we see, David was a man as all men, and, they, and, and he had weaknesses. But not only did he have a weakness for the woman that he was looking at, but he was treacherous after he had gotten with her. Not only after, you know, after he had scored and was with her, then he ready to kick her out, right? He said, go get her husband and tell her to come home and so he can sleep with her so he think the baby is here. When she say, well, I'm pregnant with child. You know, David was a cunning guy. He had a lot of gifts, didn't he? He was well-rounded. And sometimes when you're well-rounded, they ain't always positive gifts. We like to think about the positive ones, and that's the one we want to talk about in this class. But you can be well-rounded with some ch- chicanery. <laughs> Anyway, David was showing all sides that not only after he did that, he brought the husband home. The husband would not go in and sleep with his wife. He said, well, if you ain't going to do that, we'll just send you in the front of the line and had him killed. And then because then when the baby was born, remember the baby died because God took the baby away from him. And, and David's life began to go downhill after that. But as I close, I just always have to rush to the end because I think the end for me in the life of David because we, can't, we don't have time to get into Absalom and Ammon and all the other things that happened in David's life. And the sword never left his house after he committed this heinous act. Uh, but read Psalms 51 sometime. David penned that psalm. And in that psalm, he came full circle with contrition and repentance. And when you read that, I can see myself in the passage asking God, 
from all of the things that you've done and all of the places that you've gone and the things that you should not have done. He came back to ask God to forgive him and to cleanse him and to purge him with hyssop and to make him white as snow and my sins are ever before me. And he went down the line. He wasn't trying to, if I offended you, you know how some people apologize, well, if I offended you, then I'm sorry. You know, that was not David. He said, Lord, I have sinned before thee, and it's before you and you only have I sinned. And you know every time you sin, it's not you sin with someone, but you sin against God. You know that, right? Because it is God who writes the standards. It's his standards, and when you break the law, you're sinning against God, and you may be sinning with someone else. So you need to go to the person who's the author of what is right and wrong and say, God, I have broken your law. I have sinned against you. And, and, and David wrote that Psalms, and he went all the way through uh, talking about you know, his life and what he's done. There's so much we could talk about, not only about uh, his gifts, uh, his, his shortfalls, but and also his rebound. I think we can see him going full circle because God had his hand on him. He wanted him to be chosen. Uh, every, every son that came up, uh, when, they, when Samuel went to Jesse's house, he said, no, this ain't the one, this ain't the one, this is not the one. And not, he said, do you have another? He said, yeah, we got one, but he's out there looking after the sheep. I told you this boy had a job. They're always trying to get him back in the sheep form, right? You know, when, when, they, when Samuel came looking for him, they would, he wouldn't even bring him in the house with the other seven kids. He's out there watching the sheep. When, when Goliath came, he's out there, where is he? He's out there watching the sheep. So don't worry about where you think you may be at life, in life. Uh, there's always a place that God has for you, and God can elevate you. And when God elevates you, man cannot bring you down. And just remember that. So being well-rounded, using all of the gifts that God has given you, and oftentimes, you, you recognize your gifts because it's the thing that you do well. Uh, sometimes people, and Sister Sheila does a great job of uh, talking about uh, teaching that gifts selection. She used to do that all the time. So one can identify what are your gifts in life. You start off with the things that you like, the things that you do well, the things that come natural are your gifts. So basketball for me, uh, well, that ain't quite my gift. Running my mouth, that, that's a recent gift. I got that from Lisa. She loaned it to me. I'm going to give it back to her later on. But nevertheless, we can look and see and, 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 and really marvel at the, the wisdom of God because God knows the end from the beginning, right? And he knows what's going to happen and when it's going to happen. So, but it's an interesting thing when we go back and look at the text and see how God brings you through all these things. So now I bring to you the one and only, the Reverend Dr. Victoria Carr. <laughs> He's speaking prophetically, the Reverend Doctor. I'm short. I feel like I'm going to be cold. Sorry. Sorry. Um, so what I'm going to do, or what we're going to do, is take a look at the syllabus definition of um, what it means to be well-rounded. But before we do that, I just wanted to add a few extra points, some things that I saw when I was reading our scripture um, and, and, and Clarence, I think he alluded to it a little bit, but notice that in verse 16, verse 18, in chapter 16 of 1 Samuel, one of the servants answered, I have seen a son of Jesse. I have seen a son of Jesse who knows how to play the lyre. He is a brave man and a warrior. He speaks well and is fine looking and the Lord is with him. So his reputation preceded him, Right? This was a person whose reputation preceded him. People knew who he was. Not simply because he could play the lyre, but because he was a brave man. He, the Lord was with him. Um, he was a warrior. And so I, I think what I thought today was like, wow, does my reputation precede me? What does my reputation say about me? What does your reputation say about you? Is it a good reputation? Is it a reputation of someone who's being well-rounded and has many gifts and talents that you serve the Lord with? And the, the third thing, the other thing I noticed about this text is we learn why it's important to be well-rounded. Because if David had only been able to play the harp and play the lyre, do you think they would have let him into the kingdom to be with Saul? No. No, it's not. It wasn't just about his ability to play the lyre. That was one of his gifts. 
but he was a well-rounded person. He was someone who could speak. He was someone who knew what the political climate was. He was someone that they could trust the king in the, to be in the king's presence. And so even if you have a gift, if you aren't well-rounded, if you don't display that you have all these other capabilities, sometimes you risk not being able to utilize that gift. And so that's something that really stood out for me in this text. I may be a good preacher, but if I don't know what's happening in the world, if I don't talk about the conditions that are happening in, for black people in Kent or in America and, and, and people getting shot by guns, it won't be relevant for you. And it won't make a difference to this church. And the church, the church will die. See, because everything that we have, all the gifts that God has given us, it's about building the kingdom of God. Those gifts that we, we, we're supposed to reflect on, remember the questions last week, what are the gifts of the Spirit? These are the gifts that the Holy Spirit instills in each of us. Not just because, oh yeah, it's, it's cool, but because we're supposed to reach out to the people and let them know about Jesus Christ. It's a part of the mission of the church. And so we have to be careful um, to make sure that we're well-rounded so that we can use all of the gifts that God has given us. But let's turn to um, the definition um, in our syllabus. It says, the abundant life is spiritual at its core. However, authentic spirituality is always holistic. That is, it is appreciative of the arts, astute on world affairs, competent in the management of everyday things of life, and physically vibrant. King David is a model of a well-rounded servant of God. So the first thing is that to be well-rounded means you got to be appreciative of the arts. And I was, I was like, huh, appreciative of the arts. How does that make me a well-rounded person? And I started thinking about, well, art really, art is, it's got a healing property. Art can just stir the imagination and stir creativity. It gets you thinking. Art connects us to our past, right? People, when they draw, when people draw paintings, and, and or they, don't, they don't draw paintings, when they paint paintings, <laughs> when you write poetry, you know what I mean? It's like, it's, it's just depicting the reality of the time that you're in. It could just make you feel better when you, when you read a poem or when you read, uh, you know, some good literature. It stirs the imagination. It gets you thinking. You know, but, but unfortunately, <laughs> we live in a time when the art that we see, the art on TV, is, is it the kind of art that, that speaks to our yearnings and our groanings? No, not really. What is, what is the music that we're hearing? We have to understand that a lot of people say, oh, art imitates life. But I like to say that life imitates art. Think about, think about the, the hip-hop, all the hip-hop music that was once just something that black folks listened to. Now teens and 20-somethings all across white America they're being influenced by the hip-hop culture. They're so influenced and so ingrained in the culture, they're calling around, going around calling each other nigga. Hey, nigga. Excuse me? No, but, but so life imitates art. <laughs> and so I, I just, I think about, you know, our people like Marvin Gaye, what's going on, right? People, Billie Holiday's singing and Strange Fruit. Whatever, where are the artists that we have who used to write wonderful literature like Langston Hughes and Toni Morrison and Alice Walker and James Baldwin? Are there people in our time like this? Because what we have to understand is art does influence what we do and who we are. And given that, um, you know, we just have to be careful what we allow into our spirits, what kind of art that we have to make a choice. We can't just let it happen to us. So, and it's actually in the Bible, believe it or not. It's in the Bible. And I was stunned when I thought about this. Genesis, turn to Genesis 1. Turn to Genesis 1. <laughs> Clarence said, is that the New Testament? It's not the New Testament. <laughs> In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. God as creator, God as the original artist. He created everything out of nothing. Even the things that he created that made up the things, he created. He created everything. And in Psalm 8, it says, When I consider your heavens, the work of your fingers, God creates. At the end of each day when he created, he said, And it was good. 
He appreciated the beauty of his creation, right? Psalm 104, may the glory of the Lord endure forever. May the Lord rejoice in his work. God looked at what was created. I mean, look, if you look outside, isn't that art? The beauty of the world. I don't think, do you guys know what it, I mean, I'm from New York City. And to come here and look around and have mountains around and lakes and forest and snow and rain and every kind of topography, that, that is amazing to think that God created all of that. God is the ultimate artist. And then in Genesis 2, 9, the Lord God made all kinds of trees grown out of the ground, trees that were pleasing to the eye and were good. And because God made us in his image, Genesis 1, 27, we know that we are, to, we are to appreciate everything that God created, and we are to be co-creators in life and appreciate art. And as I think about the importance of appreciating art, I'm reminded of the story of this, this woman who was pretty much in a comatose state, an elderly woman and a dementia patient who didn't recognize her grandparent, her grandchildren, didn't recognize her children. She couldn't really respond to anything. And then suddenly the, the nurse said, what if I bring in some music? Not just music from 2015, but music from her era, her era. Music from the time when she was a young adult. So she played that music in this woman's eyes. And I think there's a video. Her eyes brighten up and she looks. And you can see that she's got that song in her spirit. She remembers this. So it's not just some like, you know, oh, it's nice to listen to. No, it does something to our hearts when we engage in music. When the, when the choir sings, there's something about the choir that lifts you up and ready, makes you ready to praise the Lord. There's an appreciation that gets us stirred and ready to receive the word of God. That's what art does for us. And this nurse, she understood that, that concept, that it, it moves us. And so we must be well-rounded, and we must be appreciative of art to be well-rounded. Ooh, I got like five minutes. Okay. The second thing is, to be well-rounded is to be astute in world affairs. And why, why, why is this important? Why is this important? Well, I think Pastor alluded to this before. Most of the U.S. people in the U.S. can't name their leaders, their world leaders, the mayor, the governor. Some people probably don't even know the name of the president. We don't read or watch news. We don't understand the world that we live in. Compared to the rest of the world, we, we fail miserably on tests of geography, on tests of uh, like quizzes on international affairs and things that are going on. We have only a third of Americans have passports. A third. Look at this, 50% in Australia, 60% in Canada, 80% in the UK. What is going on? This is a deficit. This is a serious problem that we don't even, we, and we have all this access, so much access that so, many, so much of the world doesn't have, and yet we're still ignorant to what's happening in the world. Ignorant. And we, we find ourselves just so confused. What? What's happening in Syria? What? I don't, I don't understand. Civil war? How did this happen? Because you weren't following along the whole time. Climate change? Do I need to recycle? <laughs> yes. Yes, you should recycle. The world's going to end because we don't take care of the planet. <laughs> right? We have policies on education and health care and women's rights. Hello, women, reproductive rights. They want to cancel Planned Parenthood. Did you know that? They don't want to fund it anymore. Do we know this? And you know what? When people start to complain about the mayor or the governor or the president, I say, excuse me, did you vote? Oh, no, you didn't vote. You ain't got nothing to say to me then. You can't complain. You can't complain if you didn't participate in the process. Because we have to be the change that we want to see. But if we don't know what's happening around us, we can't be anybody's change. You, you got you to pay attention. You got to be astute. So I don't want to take your scripture for next week, but I'm going to. Daniel, let's turn to Daniel. I'll just read a short piece of it. Daniel <laughs> chapter 1. Because we're going to talk about, this is an astute man, a person who knew. Let me see if I can get to it. Let's see. 
We're going to read just a short piece. Daniel chapter 1, verses 3 to 4. Then we're going to jump down to 17 through 20. Because everything's in the scripture. You know this, right? Who, who wants to read? I'll call on somebody. Anybody, 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 anybody? Okay, so Daniel chapter 1, verses 3 to 4. And the king spake unto Aspenaz, the master of his eunuchs, that he should bring certain of the children of Israel, and of the king's seed, and of the princes, children in whom was no blemish, but well favored, and skillful in all wisdom, and cunning in knowledge, and understanding science, and such as had ability in them to stand in the king's palace, and whom they might teach the learning and the tongue of the Chaldeans. You want me to go to 17? Yes. Yes. 17 through 20. As for these four children, God gave them knowledge and skill in all learning and wisdom, and Daniel had understanding in all visions and dreams. Now at the end of the days that the king had said he should bring them in, then the prince of the eunuchs brought them in before Nebuchadnezzar. And the king communed with them, and among them all was found none like unto Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. Therefore stood they before the king. And in all matters of wisdom and understanding that the king inquired of them, he found them ten times better than all the magicians and astrologers that were in all his realm. Mm. Daniel and the three Hebrew boys were well-informed, quick to understand, and well-qualified to serve in the king's palace. They had many gifts. But do you think, once again, just like David, would they be serving in the king's palace if it was just about being well-informed? No, they had many other traits. They had many other traits that made, that made it possible to get them into this position so that they can be in the service of the king. And why was that important? Because the king ultimately praised the Lord. When he saw the miracle that was done, remember they went into the fiery furnace and they came out and they went burnt? Remember that? They weren't singed, not a hair on their body, and there was someone standing in the furnace with them. And King Nebuchadnezzar said, what the, what the what? Your God is the true God. I will let nobody harm your people. So, so they went through a very trying, fiery time. They went through some serious trials, but it was all a part of God's plan to make sure that his will would be done on earth, right? King Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon didn't know anything about the Hebrew God, the Jewish God, but because of them and because of their witness, because of their ability to, to, to trust and have faith in the Lord, they, in their well-roundedness, he knew God for himself. Other reasons why we need to be well-informed. You guys travel? Have you ever traveled anywhere? You should study what's happening in the country before you go. You should pay attention to what's happening in the country while you're there. I went to South Africa with uh, Emmanuel Baptist Church back in 2008. When we were there, they decided to have a protest. And it wasn't anybody's, you know, little, ah, do you provide for it was like, oh, 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 oh. And we were like, oh, snap. And, you know, no one's going outside. I mean, this was like, this is like serious, you know, people are stomping in the streets and just like, so we were like, oh. Now imagine if we were just la, 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 walking around, didn't know what was happening, didn't understand what a protest meant in the South African context. It wasn't our protest with our signs and, hell no, we won't go. No, it wasn't the same. We had to understand what it meant in South Africa to be at a protest. So Reverend Trufant said, no one's leaving the hotel, right? What about y'all work? Y'all, y'all, you want to be competitive in the workforce? Maybe we need to learn another language, Japanese or Spanish, right? Do you know anything about the customs of other cultures? For some people, you don't look someone in the eye. That's a sign of disrespect. You don't shake someone's hand in somebody's culture and use the right or the left hand. You have to make sure which hand you're using. You can offend somebody. You can lose a job behind that kind of stuff. What else? What else? Other reasons why 
Um, just because you want to learn about cultures other than your own. As African-American people, how many times have people stereotyped us based on what they saw on TV, right? Oh, well, she must be a thief. She must be a, a welfare queen. He must be a thief. You know, they don't value education. Look at their kids. How many times have people stereotyped us? And because of our willful ignorance, we just assume we know everything about the Syrians or about those Muslims. But what we need to do is become informed and read the newspaper. Read, see, go to CNN. It's online. Everything is at our fingertips. I mean, think about, yeah, I talked about this earlier. Pastor Braxton or myself, if we weren't up on world, uh, world events, it would just be the most boring. Have you ever been to a sermon? We just, everything was strict. I mean, I, this is the Bible. Everything we need is in the Bible. But we connect the Bible to what's happening in our lives today. If we don't do that, it's boring. It's dead. And so we have to do that to make it alive. But that's what we have to do. And the third thing, ooh, I'm over, is <laughs> to be well-rounded is to be physically vibrant. Vibrant. Scripture, Matthew 6. I'll read it. Matthew 6, 16 through 18. When you fast... Do not look somber as the hypocrites do, for they disfigure their faces to show others they are fasting. Truly I tell you, they have received their reward in full. But when you fast, put oil on your head and wash your face so that it will not be obvious to others that you are fasting, but only to your Father who is unseen, and your Father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. Hmm. Do you think... If you walk around, God has been so good to me. I trust in the Lord. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. So you could, you could be the best gospel singer in the world. You can get up on that stage and you can have the best voice and your whole alpha could be put together. But if you... Do you realize that people are watching you up there? People are expecting you to, to bring it, man. They want to see that the Lord has done something for you in your life. They want to see this because it reminds us, wow, I can, I can get through the time. But I knew a chaplain. I knew a chaplain. Oh, my God, he was a hot mess. Back in New York City, first of all, he always dropped food on his shirt. And it was like, I don't think he washed his clothes because he would come and have crust all down his shirt. He'd have crust in his name tag. He was obese. He kind of had a funky smell. And he was just very anxious. He had a very anxious pre presence about him. But the crazy thing is he knew scripture back and forth. He could, we could talk about scripture. He knew about world events. He knew what was happening in the world. He was a very lovely person, very nice person when you got past all that. But do you think, hi, I'm Chaplain Victoria from Spiritual Care. Do you, would you like some support? No. If someone came into your hospital room and you're laying up on the bed sick, do you want this? This is how he was. So he had these wonderful gifts, right? The gift of, 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 of just being able to, sh to, to, to share the presence of God and to be with people through their suffering, to stand with them in their suffering even as they were dying. But he couldn't get in the door because of the way he, he appeared. He lacked that spirit, that vibrancy. No one wanted him to come into the room, and he couldn't understand why. We tried to tell him, but he just didn't get it. So you have to understand that even if you have a gift, you have to be a well-rounded person that you can use the gift to build up the kingdom. Ooh, I love this. Matthew 26. Look at the birds of the air. They do not sow or reap or store away in barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much more valuable than they? Can any one of you, wor by worrying, add a single hour to your life? Too many of us let our situations dictate our joy. It is not your situation. It is not how much money you have. It is not whether you're married and have the children that you want. 
none of these things t- determine your joy. Your joy comes from another source. So when I see you on the street, when I see you sitting in the choir loft, when I see you at the job, do you display an evidence that God has done something for you in your life? Is it clear that God is moving in your life? As a Christian, you have to evidence those, the gifts, right? You have to evidence that you have the fruits of the Spirit, the love, the joy, the peace, the faithfulness, the endurance. Keep going. Forbearance. I want people to look at me and and feel like, wow, she knows the Lord. She knows the Lord. I remember, (laughs) actually, when I first started really studying the Word and getting into the Word, when I worked at NYU probably like 10 years ago, people were like, do you have a boyfriend? (laughs) You You just look so different. You just have this smile on your face, and you got a man, don't you? I said, I do have a man, Jesus Christ. Actually, I don't have a man. I have the man. Ain't no man giving me this kind of joy. (laughs) Because I was single. (laughs) But, I mean, it's true. It's true. So, finally, and we're way over, competent are you, <laughs> to be well-rounded is to be competent in everyday things. Um, I'm going to read the scriptures because we're over. Ephesians 5, 15 through 17. Be very careful then how you live, not as unwise but as wise, making the most of every opportunity, because the days are evil. Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the Lord's will is. Hmm. Making the most of every opportunity means you got to plan. You got to prioritize. You got to make your priorities have to be what God's priorities are. And God plans. For the, I know the plans I have for you, Jeremiah 29 and 11, right? God has plans for us to prosper us, to give us a hope in a future. So if we want to follow the plans of God, we have to prioritize. We have to, to manage all the things of life. God is a planner. We have to be planners. We have to be able to put these plans into action. Um, uh, let's think about this. Do we, as, a black, as black people, manage our finances? No. We got almost twice as much student loan debt as, as, as white Americans. We got more credit card debt. We don't manage our finances. We don't manage our health. I went to the CDC and looked it up, and I was so upsetting. I'm going to read this list because it's going to keep going on and on. I just want you to get the the effect of it. Let's see. Hmm. Higher rates of obesity, diabetes, hypertension, periodontis, HIV, heart disease and stroke, colorectal cancer, death by homicide, higher infant mortality rates. Nearly three-fourths of American children are born out of wedlock. We are not managing our health. We make excuses. I don't have health insurance anymore because my job ended on September 30th. But the other day I got sick. You know what I did? I went online and I looked free clinics, free and low-cost clinics. One was 15 minutes away from my house. I drove there. But, I mean, $40 copay. That was it. $2 prescription. And when I was there, they asked me about my, my HIV status and if I was diabetic and if all these other health things. Stop making excuses, people. Get your stuff together. We are dying, literally. We have to manage our health. We have to manage our finances. We have to manage our homes and our families and our children. Right? Are you letting the the, the TV raise your children? Are you raising your children? Are you involved in their life? Are you going to parent-teacher conference? Are you involved in what's happening in their lives? Our kids aren't completing high school. They're dropping out. This is, this is ridiculous. We have to be able to manage all of the, all of the things that happen in our life. My, my brother, he said to me a few years ago, he was like, I don't understand these women. They don't know how to cook. <laughs> women in my generation, he's 10 years younger than me, women in my generation don't know how to cook. And this is, I really like her, but her house is kind of messy. And, and, uh, she cares more about, like, getting new shoes than she does about getting a file organizer to put her crap away. Is this somebody I'm supposed to consider for my wife who's going to raise my children? 
Is this who I'm supposed to consider? And I don't want to sound sexist because my brother can cook. The men in my family can cook. The women in my family can cook. That's why he expects people to cook. So you may be pretty. He may look real good. Maybe that's your gift, or you think it is. <laughs> or maybe you have some other gifts. There are no children in here, right? Um, <laughs> but, right, right, you know, guy, the older, <laughs> listen, I've heard many, as I've gotten older, I've had older guy friends, right? So they're like, you know, it just, we need to have something to talk about. <laughs> you know, like, uh, eventually we need to talk. You know, you may look pretty on my arm and everything, but, you know, can you manage the household? Can you manage the finances? What it's, what's, you know, can you, can you manage your health? You know, you, maybe someone was supposed to be with my brother, but because they didn't have their life together, they lost out on that gift, that opportunity, that plan that God had. So all I'm saying, I love it. Um, so, so really, people, we just be, need to be able to, to manage all of, the, of the, the daily tasks that we have so that we can walk in the fullness that God desires for us. I mean, think about, I, I think there's this, there's this book that we're reading now, um, the, the deacons and the ministers. You guys are reading the book. Who's a deacon in here? What's the book? Emotionally Healthy Church. And the guy is talking about, the pastor is talking about how he neglected his wife, right? And his family. If Pastor Braxton neglected Sheila and them kids, if this one over here was popping it like it's hot, dropping out of school all over the place, wouldn't you start to wonder, he can't manage his own household. How do I expect him to manage the church? He is a gifted preacher, and he cares about us so deeply. He's a social justice person. But when you see that he can't manage his, his home life, that he doesn't make them a priority, it, hmm, it impacts the mission of the church. The church will not grow because we won't put our trust in Pastor Braxton. But thankfully, she's very lovely. <laughs> and she finished school. <laughs> so anyway, we've gone way over. Um, I think that's the end. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord, everybody. <laughs> All right, let's give her a hand as she gathers her things. So, well grounded. Last week we talked about the importance of putting God first. Matthew six thirty three. But seek ye first the kingdom of God. And one of the things I walked away with was the importance of getting things in order. Putting God first, foundational, well grounded. Matthew six thirty three. Putting things in their right order. We can't do anything if things are all chaotic. Putting things in the right order, well-rounded. It allows us to be stretched and broadened, gives us exposure, and allow and encourage us to be competent in many things. Well-rounded, taking a look at our culture, our arts, political matters, world affairs. We should be well-spoken and physically vibrant, well rounded. Amen. Let us um, all minds clear. I'm going to ask Brother Gillens, would you pray for us, please? Let us pray. Father God, eternal Father, we just thank you for this house of learning, Lord. This house that we can run to, Lord, and seek your face, Lord joined with brothers and sisters, with saints, with prayer partners, Lord, under good teaching, under good practical teaching, Lord, on how to live our lives. Father, we go through so much during the week. We go through so much challenge. We go through so much fleshly challenge, Lord. And then you with your Holy Ghost, your Holy Spirit, provide us this house, so we thank you, Lord. We thank you for this house of prayer, this house of meditation, this house of growth, this house of learning. 
Now, Father, be with us. Visit us, Lord. At night, during the day, Lord, be with us when we pray. Be with us throughout the week, Lord, so that these things, Lord, might be nailed fast to our hearts, Lord. With your Holy Ghost, quicken these things, Lord, so that we might gain eternal, abundant life. And may that be, Lord, to your glory. We all agree and pray in Jesus' name. And we all say, amen.